he was here for a couple of days. Please take advantage of the opportunity to meet and chat with him if you haven't already. Um, uh, I don't need to, I guess, overview his many interesting accomplishments, but one of his assistant interests is uh, uh, pulsars and pulsar winds, and he was going to tell us uh, about how uh, ions behave. No, no, not really. Okay. How current sheets evolve in pulsar winds. They are, well, current sheets may be made of ions, but they might not. Okay. I should start this one. Okay. <laughs> Please. Thank you, Chris. As Chris says, this is a persistent interest. I keep, uh, like the dog worrying a bone, I keep worrying at it and trying to extract some more juice, some more, some more marrow from the inside and some more, some more fragments or whatever on the edge. So I put a little rose gallery of some of these uh, systems. Pulsars in their, their um, surrounding nebulae are probably our, they're almost our oldest example of a compact object fed system. Uh, they're somewhat antedated by the discovery of uh, jets from active galactic nuclei, but with, because of the presence of the pulsar in the middle and being able to identify the pulse period and its uh, period derivative, we're in much better shape than in almost anything else for understanding the en energy budget. And since they're up close and personal, you get all this wonderful imagery, and some of it's time dependent, as you'll see, uh, of what they look like. So there's a little bit of a rose gallery here, all coming from optical and X-ray imaging. Uh, there's also fantastic radio imaging. There's our uh, the most studied of the example, the Crab Nebula is seen as X-rays, where there's the pulsar in the middle, and there's this, uh, the X-rays come from this torus-like structure. The presence of something like that was inferred a long time ago by, because the crab is occulted by the moon uh, at certain times of the year, and the passing that knife edge across it allowed people looking at uh, the X-ray uh, light curve to infer that there was some sort of extended structure that was not spherical with respect to the object. Uh, things have improved in the 30 years since those, occu those occ occulting Im images were made until this is the Chandra image made around 2000. And you can see this toroidal structure around the pulsar in the middle. This uh, axis of the torus is also the axis uh, along which the proper motion occurs and is, is thought to be the axis of the rotation axis of the pulsar, which is, of course, tiny. This physical scale here is approximately a light year. Uh, the pulsar's magnetosphere, the region under rotational control of the magnetic field, is uh, thought to be 1,500 kilometers across. We will not be imaging that anytime soon. Um, but we can image where all the energy goes, and what shows up here in this luminous emission uh, is, uh, if you sum over all wave bands, is about uh, between 15 and 20 percent of the total energy being lost from this rotating flywheel in the center. Uh, these are some other examples by, by which less is known, but this is a Chandra image of the nebula around PSR 1509, which is the third uh, largest spin-down energy loss object uh, of of this class that we know. Uh, and there's a pulsar there. There's the toroidal structure in the x-rays around it. There's a rather elongated so-called jet-like feature, much more so than is present here. Uh, up here, there's thermal gas in the interstellar medium into which something is slamming and uh, making it light up. Uh, this is the guts of the vela around the vela pulsar. The vela, the, these objects are both about between 1 and 2,000 years old. Uh, the Vela Pulsar is more like 10,000 years old. And you can see, again, some sort of toroidal structure in its vicinity. It's thought this is kind of a double pancake. Imagine the pulsar in the middle, and then uh, a ring above, along a ring centered on this uh, jet axis here, which is, again, thought to be the rotation axis, um, and uh, lined up uh, one, one lying on top of the other. Uh, this is the nebula in uh, 
the radio source 3C58. Uh, the toroidal structure is in this up and down direction here. Again, this is as seen in the x-rays. This is quite recent stuff. This object was really only um, the radio source has been known for a long time, given its title 3C58. It was identified as an x-ray source uh, rather recently, and the pulsar itself was only discovered three years ago. Um, it's very faint in the radio. Um, it also does show up in the x-rays when you know what period to look at. So my, the reason to study these things is if you want to understand this system, uh, this class of systems, which are, uh, are first and has taught us a great deal about how magnetic fields can extract energy from a rotating compact object and turn it into something that appears in the outside world as uh, very high energy accelerated particles which are radiating synchrotron radiation. A phenomenon which we believe appears uh, in much more extended variety in the uh, spectacular jets that come from active galactic nuclei and get, uh, where something is being extracted from the disk around a black hole. And there are models of gamma ray bursts which go about things in a similar way. That is a very strong magnetic field, relativistically strong such that the energy density, magnetic energy density exceeds the rest energy density of the plasma, organizing itself into an organized outflow structure uh, which lands up when it slams into the outside world, converting that energy into uh, highly accelerated particles. All of these systems are pevatrons. The radiation that we see at the highest energy photons is coming out of synchrotron radiation coming from PEV particles. And uh, they're amazingly efficient, depends on which one. This little nebula in here around Vila is very inefficient, and it's interesting to understand why. These others are much more efficient at this 10 and 20 percent level, something at the level that the, uh, the generator down here in the object down in the middle is a rotating magnetic field, which is the same as the generators in the powerhouses that turn keep our lights on. Uh, we don't do anything like as well at converting the energy supplied to the rotating armature of the, in the powerhouse uh, into what's usable at the far end. So it's one of the, depends, you know, what, what your taste runs to, but I always find it fascinating trying to figure out how nature does this so well without having, without having to invoke a designer who gets in there and fixes it just, just so. I don't like just so stories. Um, the, um, so consider this as an archetype, these systems as small scale archetypes of AGM. Oh, I should say one other thing, just so people don't go away feeling blinded by the pictures. This jet-like features, uh, they're there, they're, they're collimated, but they're not thought to be jets formed by the neutron star itself. No one's figured out how to make the neutron star do it directly. Uh, what we think happens, and I'll show some pictures from the, the, the reigning theory at the moment, uh, is uh, that the stuff goes out into a surrounding medium which inertially confines it, and in going splash in the medium, the wound up magnetic field is then a able to exert, w once the stuff stops moving relativistically and is contained in this bag, the bag has toroidal magnetic field in it, and toroidal magnetic field like the hoops on a barrel provide tension stress with push stuff in and it's thought that that crowds stuff in on the axis and then the tube of toothpaste uh, phenomenon they, makes the stuff squirt out in a polar direction. And that's a quite successful macroscopic model for what's going on. <coughs> so let me say a little bit about the physics of the underlying critter. Um, the uh, what we know from analyzing these pictures is that the number of loss rate of particles coming out of these things is very large compared to a fiducial number named after Peter Golreich and Bill Julian, who invented the uh, first round of concepts of what a pulsar magnetosphere is like. They said, uh, gee, if I rotate that magnetic field in a vacuum, it creates huge electric fields which will suck particles off the surface. Uh, and uh, they'll suck particles off the surface. Like any plasma, it loves to adjust itself so as to try to get rid of the electric field, short it out. 
that requires a certain f charge density in the magnetosphere. Uh, they imagined that, that along the polar field lines, which went out far from the star uh, to distances so far that a charged particle could no longer be forced to co-rotate, that charged particles there would take that density and they'd escape at the speed of light, giving a number loss rate that's called the goreg julian rate. And that is uh, this number right here. It's C times the electric potential of the system. I'm rotating a magnetic field, so I get, like any dynamo, I get an electric voltage. Uh, divide by E, I will get then, I uh, will go from a current flow, C times phi, uh, divide by E gives me a charged particle flow, which for our favorite example, the crab pulsar, is around 10 to the 34 particles per second. It's, you know, in terms of mass loss, it's tiny. Uh, and this is just to give you an idea of the scale that's going on here, this voltage, which turns out to be the square root of the uh, total spin-down energy loss rate that's due to exerting electromagnetic torques on the star. Take that energy loss rate, divide by C, take its square root, that gives you a voltage. And I converted, since I like to work in CGS, this should have been uh, around 10 to the 14 stat volts per centimeter, but I, you know, I never think like, I, I, I don't think like that. They use the MKS, so it's around, Crab pulsar is uh, 410 to the 16 volts, so it's a very good pevatron, at least in potential. Uh, and this, depend, this conclusion depends only a little bit of modeling applied to the known observations to measure p dot and period, which are for the crab are these numbers right here. Uh, if you believe what they said, and uh, I certainly do, um, there's a, a current that goes with this, which is uh, C times phi, that turns out to be 410 to the 16 amperes. And there's an energy loss, just remember your old circuits, uh, the um, current, current times voltage is an energy. Uh, the energy loss rate is I times the current, which is C times phi squared, which is uh, this characteristic number um, in the uh, uh, energy loss rates. In fact, the original model for pulsar spin down, actually proposed before pulsars were discovered, just took this same expression right here, which is a consequence of saying a rotator bar magnet in vacuum, make it an oblique rotator so it keeps changing in time. It'll radiate electromagnetic waves at the uh, rotation rate, and that's the energy loss rate from such a creature. And that was proposed as the power source for the Crab Nebula before the Crab Pulsar was discovered. Uh, the gent who did so, Franco Pacini, then once pulsars were discovered, got real, real famous out of that. Um, now, in order to feed this, this is the X-ray nebula seen from Chandra. Is this a line? Yes. Right there. There's the pulsar. There's this ring-like structure, which is, uh, and then there's the overall torus around it and these plumes sticking out. Um, you can, the structure of the nebula is such that if you look at, you're looking at synchrotron radiation, so high energy particles lose energy very rapidly. Uh, if particles are being injected from some interior region, the very highest energy particles won't survive very long. So the nebula will be smaller at high energy, photon energy, than it is at low. That is true. The X-ray nebula is smaller than the optical nebula, which is smaller than the infrared nebula, which is smaller than the radio nebula. The infrared and, and radio are kind of comparable because when you go through the numbers, the lifetime of an electron, or as it turns out, a positron, um, in emitting at radio or infrared energies is greater, greater than the age of the system, which is known to be about a 1,000 years because it corresponds to a Chinese reported supernova in uh, 1054. I always make the mistake of thinking it's 1066, but it's uh, the... Um <coughs> so, and you go through the lifetime of the particles making x-rays is, however, is very short, uh, sort of like uh, 50 years. And so you have to resupply them. The spectrum, I didn't show the spectrum of the nebula as a whole, but the nebula actually emits all the way up in synchrotron radiation, all the way up to 50, GEV, 50 MeV synchrotron radiation, MeV synchrotron radiation. 
the lifetime of those particles is less than a year. So you have to resupply them quickly. Uh, the only source anybody has figured out for that is coming from the pulsar itself. So the number of flux from the pulsar is much larger than this fiducial goldreich julian number. And there has to be some means of, for the pulsar to supply that. Just ripping charges off from the surface until you short out the electric fields isn't good enough. That would give like 10 to the 34 per second. As you'll see as we go on, uh, the um, uh, fiducial number that we seem to need for the Crab Nebula, where the measurements are actually reasonably good, is more like 10 to the 40th per second. And so you have to come up with a source for that. It's thought to be that deep in the magnetosphere, the, uh, there are residual electric fields that are unshorted which accelerate particles, they radiate gamma rays in the very strong magnetic field region. And then by, uh, uh, you take a gamma ray and collide it with a virtual photon of the magnetic field, it can convert to an E plus minus pair. And it's thought that that process provides a dense plasma which comes spat out and turns into a wind that flows out, uh, flowing out from the pulsar, filling this cavity, terminating when the dynamic pressure of the wind is equal to the pressure of the already built up stuff in the nebula. And indeed, this distance here between the pulsar and this ring is about what you expect. Simply take the energy loss rate E dot and divide by 4 pi r squared c, and you land up getting a, a pressure which, if you equate that to the measured pressure in the nebula, it's around this distance of a, a tenth of a light year or so. Um, now, one of the things that's happened in the past decade is as we've been doing high resolution observations. We are able to uh, see time variability. It's another nice feature of this system. So you have not only imaging and this is supposed to be a movie that works. It didn't. Is this one? No. Hmm. Well, I'm not going to take the time to do that because it's not the center of what I want to do. But what you find is this system is radiating, is varying in time. Um, and this structure here is, looks as if it's behaving like something as a piston bouncing on the outside world, uh, which um, uh, is compressing it and sending macroscopic waves propagating outwards. And that's an interesting, and this is a, this comes from a simulation of that done by Niccolo Bucciantini, uh, where the outflow coming out, uh, more or less in the equator, uh, as it's zipping past the stuff that's bounced off the surrounding walls and comes back, has an interesting kind of overturn instability that makes uh, fluctual co compressions and fluctuations in the magnetic field, which also start traveling outwards. Um, so uh, from comparing that kind of model to these images, you're able to conclude that this interesting number, sigma, over here, the magnetic energy divided by the flow kinetic energy is a number, by the time you get to the, sh to the termination zone here, it's thought to be a shock wave, that that number is much less than one. And that conclusion has been around in modeling these systems now for about 30 years. Um, and it's a big surprise because when you look at the underlying magnetosphere and you apply the simplest basic theory you might imagine, which is mag uh, ideal magnetohydrodynamics, it should not be true. Uh, what this, this number, at the, by the time you get to the end of the flow, should be something like uh, several hundred to maybe several thousand, depending on exactly what you think the density is. Uh, not so. Instead, it, the, these models right here land up telling you this number is like um, something between 0.01 and 0.1, at least as averaged over the termination region here, uh, looking out of, the, out of the plane of the flow. So th this has been a big theoretical puzzle about why does this system decide to act as if it's throwing away magnetic energy. Has latitude, it does have latitude dependence, it's two-dimensional. Uh, 
axisymmetric. It doesn't have azimuthal dependence into it. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the main thing that they built into it at the central source is they assumed that the incoming magnetic field was toroidally wrapped up going one way in the northern hemisphere and wrapped up the other way in the other hemisphere, which is not significant. They've run the same, qualitatively significant, they've run the same simulations uh, taking the magnetic, doing something artificial, had the magnetic field wound one way everywhere. It does same thing, because the, you know, the compressions that make the jets like all depend on B squared. Um, but it, in the more detailed quantitative comparison, it's a bit better to have that region in the equator where the field reverses. And for their purposes, that we don't understand the details of the field reversal between he one hemisphere and the other. They model it with various assumptions about the scale length at which that happens. No, uh, the way they do it is that they have the pointing flux is varying the latitude, and the, they took the mass flux uh, to be a single number. They didn't put any latitude dependence on it at all. Again, there's, you know, we're ignorant of the details, so they just kept it simple. Joe? Yeah. I'm just confused a little bit by the, um, like, uh, the models behave as if uh, Oh, there we go. What do you know? Yeah. Um, the left is the facts, the right is, the right is, a, is an MHD simulation. So is it uh, in order to like, reproduce the data, you need to sort of uh, plug in parameters like small signals, or that's, um, or that's what you sort of derive from the, the model? Or? Uh, the fact that sigma is small is an inference from getting a model to, rep to replicate this kind of behavior. Okay. All right. If you do it with high sigma, that is it's a pointing flux, the equivalent of a pointing flux dominated jet, a pointing flux dominated wind, you can't make the thing stop, okay, without doing something. I once had a long discussion with Chris about well, what you could do is that the toroidal magnetic field is unstable and makes the magnetic field all cellular and behave like a gas of gamma equals four thirds. Uh, that could be true. The current state of affairs, toroidal fields are supposed to be unstable to kinking up and nodding. The current gospel is being that gospel is being attacked at the moment by people who have started dealing with the nonlinear kinking instabilities in these relativistic flows uh, numerically, who think that it's not as unstable as people thought. And that's a story that's you know there's a whole lot there's a whole lot more to be said. Uh, as anybody who looks at kinking up of solar magnetic fields, there's a great deal to be said, and it's not so not something that settles very easily. Uh, these systems behave as if there is no, there, there is a macroscopic toroidal field. In terms of doing this modeling, you have no need of anything that's really complicated about the field structure. And you don't want to go make it too complicated because there's a lot of polarization that goes with this. So if you turn the field into a very small scale knotted structure such that every, every, uh, uh, pixel of the telescope is seeing a lot of different cells of magnetic field along the line of sight, it would be hard to sustain the polarization that you see. Uh, so there's a lot of room in this of how messy you go. But, um, okay, so that help? Yeah, yeah. So sigma, sigma, the sigma numbers come out of applying these kinds of models. And, and on one, you do one-dimensional models, you want the thing, whole thing to slow down and not being expanding any faster than the nebula. It was expanding at sea. It's expanding, the, when it gets out of the nebula, it's expanding at 1,000 kilometers a second. The, you infer that sigma has then to be something like V over C. And you do that. Doing it in multi-dimensions, sigma is increased by about an order of magnitude over what those one-dimensional models said, maybe a factor of five, because they allow more for storing energy in stuff that's circulating around in the interior. Um, but it's not qualitatively different. You can't stuff a, uh, a, something that's falling out relativistically into a closed box that's been moving non-relativistically without doing something. So this all here is, I didn't, I didn't mention it, thank you. Uh, this all happens, the length of the set of observations that led to the movie on the left was eight months. 
And the fact that it's repeating is because the, the, the movie is folded. There is an experiment that was supposedly done, and it's in, the, it's in uh, Koji Mori's computer of 16 months to try to see what the periodicity really is. And he got sucked off into working on Suzaku and hasn't kept at it. This is a, 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 not the world's most popular subject. And his job and his rewards are not coming from getting that stuff out. So nobody's managed to extract it from him. Um, I've seen, he showed me a little bit of what the results look like. And it's, the periodicity is probably, looks, you know, 18 months, 16 months isn't long enough either. But it's consistent with a periodicity of around six months. That thing bouncing back and forth, that's some artifact in the telescope. Yes, yes, yes. If you look at this, it's not strictly axisymmetric. It's nodding, uh, and the knots are changing and moving. And then you can see these outgoing waves that I mentioned here. So this thing is behaving as if it's like a bellows pumping. The geometry of its toroidal magnetic field is what's being pumped out here is magnetosonic waves into the surrounding medium. Um, and. Uh, the nodding is not understood, if you ask me to speculate, of the many projects I have on back, various back burners of ever larger stoves. Uh, it's some, the most obvious thing you, th you would think of is, in this context is something known as a, a mirror instability. That is, particles coming in, hitting this toroidal magnetic field. They hit it, and they start out by gyrating more or less in a plane perpendicular to the magnetic field. That's a particle configuration very similar to the old uh, magnetic confinement mirror machines, which are unstable to a, an isotropy instability, which causes the, causes a flux tube to go form up into clumps. Okay. And that's, you're sort of seeing there, that's not an utterly unreasonable supposition to pursue. To the best of my knowledge, nobody, including me, has actually pursued that quantitatively. And, um, it doesn't, not an issue that seems to have much effect on the overall energy flow. If you don't understand the zeroth order stuff, worrying about the higher order stuff seems a little pre You can do it, and it's fun, but other things tend to attract attention. So, what was the last What do you see as most of the radiation uh, energy bubbles coming out? In the Crab Nebula, it's synchrotron radiation up to about 30 MeV, where the syn synchrotron spectrum is dying off rapidly. That takes PeV particles to do that. So, it is 30 MeV. The spectrum is flat enough that it's ki it's kind of like equal energy per decade once you get above, you know, through the optical and above. So a lot of the energy comes out there, but not all. So uh, now I'm going to back up to uh, the kind of model I want to talk about for what the wind is doing. Um, this is a from a Gotta find that button again. Come on, there you are. Um, there we go. This is from an axisymmetric simulation of the magnetosphere done in, in MHD We're using the force free approximation. This is from Spitkovsky's version of it. There's now uh, either four or five groups that have done this, and they all agree. Uh, what the magnetosphere looks like in MHD, remember this high flux of pairs is much denser than this go right Julian density. So the first thing you'd say about it is the magnetosphere has figured out how to short out all components of electric field parallel to B. That puts you in a condition where you can start doing MHD, magnetohydrodynamics in its relativistic form. That's what people have done. Uh, it took, uh, between Goldreich's original suggestion of this in 1969 and a successful accomplishment of calculating a model like this in the force free approximation, it took 30 years. Because the thing, whole problem, this is just a lesson uh, of, uh, and consistent with modern astrophysics, it, the whole problem became a plaything of uh, applied mathematicians. For the aligned rotator, you can write down a, if you have the right taste, a pretty looking partial, nonlinear partial differential equation with an unknown function in it. And people would try solving this by supposing forms the unknown function of the, of the magnetic flux. And a couple cases it could be done for the pure monopole with no closed field lines. 
And for something that was completely closed and no outflow, so all the currents are toroidal. Um, and, uh, but for the flow system with its free surface of defining where the last closed field line is, it really evaded any attempt to do anything. So finally, at the end of the 90s, uh, Ioannis Kantopoulos put together a relaxation scheme on the computer and succeeded in producing a, uh, a solution that looks like this. His is cruder than this, and things have gotten better in the course of time. There's the closed field lines there. There's a dipole in the middle. The line, line rotator of the dipole is up there. It's parallel to the rotation axis. Uh, there's a separatrix that separates closed field lines from open. There's the last closed field line, which is thought to be the last closed field line touches this thing, the surface called the light cylinder, right, which is at 1.0 on the scale. Uh, that's the radius at which a particle stuck to a field line and co-rotating would be going at exactly the speed of light which, of course, no real particle can do. Uh, but it sets a boundary to where you can have co-rotating plasma. So in here, it's all co-rotating stuff. Um, the uh, the force-free approximation is based on the idea the energy density in fields is huge compared to the plasma energy densities. So you neglect all the inertias, the pressures, and all of that, and it's purely electromagnetic object. Uh, there's a current sheet that reads from the equator. Out here, there's this magnetic field structure has in it a, a radial current, which for the topology I've drawn with the magnetic moment parallel to the rotation axis, the radial current corresponds to electrons leaving. There's a balancing current. It's an open circuited system. There's a balancing current, which is positive current. Uh, in principle, could be electrons coming back from somewhere else, but coming back from f too far away is a little hard dynamically because there's a great deal of pointing flux here, and to, to drop a particle into it, uh, it's pretty hard to make it just swim upstream perfectly happily. So I imagine the system is representing a classic open-circuited dynamo. There's electrons leaving here. There's ions leaving. There's positive charge leaving there. Uh, there's Earth way out here. And the currents finally close out in the Earth system. And you look at Goldreich's original paper. He drew a little toy picture like that. This picture is consistent with that. This is focusing in from this uh, simulation of what the structure is near this last closed field line at the critical point where it, it goes into this current here. And what you see here is field lines that are closed there, field lines that are open here. The, uh, and the actual simulation, because there's numerical resistivity, this Y point is bouncing around all the time. The dissipation causes it to become locally dynamic, which will surprise no one. And this is a different simulation that I uh, worked with Niccolo Pocantino on. It's a relativistic MHD simulation with inertia included. And uh, the current sheet here turned, uh, became unstable and turned into a whole bunch of plasmoids. There are bunches of hot plasma that emerge from this region here and travel out along the current sheet uh, in the, at velocities almost the speed of light. Uh, the um, on average, this thing looks like this time stationary calculation here, but it shows a little bit of what the physics you expect, that the magnetosphere is actually locally unstable, hopping around with the pointing flux is hopping around on a time scale of order of the rotation period. The main point I want to get across, though, here is that you have converging out of here in this current sheet region. Uh, attaching the current sheet, there's an outflow of ions and possibly positrons uh, coming out of here, where the uh, source of positrons come, probably come, would, come, would come. They're not, not in the MHD simulation uh, from the outflow and the wind, where reconnection flows here that are uh, causing this variability in the formation of these plasmoids going are taking plasma from the side and stuffing it in here. And that provides a source of charge for a positive charge outflow. So then you worry about what is the nature of the open circuit here. Uh, it could be you extract ions all the way from the surface out to here and inject them in the outside world. It could be the return current going back to the star as electrons precipitating. For that, you need a source of plasma here. And this kind of reconnection flow here is able to do that. That has not been modeled quantitatively yet, but it's clearly hiding in this kind of MHD stuff. The real point I want to get to is that what's injected into the current sheet is some sort of uh, outflowing particle beam. 
So observe pulsars take oblique rotators. And this is, again, from Spitkowski's work. This is a movie of his simulation of the oblique rotator in force-free electrodynamics. It was done for 60 degrees. This, you can see it going around. And the one color of field lines is the field lines are, which are directed inwards. The other color of field lines are the field lines are directed outwards. And you can see these sectors. That is, as you rotate the polar caps around, first you get outward going field lines that are then vectored out. Then there's a layer of inward going field lines that are vectored out, and then outward, inward. The result of which it creates a outward going structure which looks like this. This is a, a plot of, from a simple, and it turns out analytic calculation, which you can, which uh, Sergei Bogovalov did for the um, split monopole, where you can actually get an analytic solution for the field structure, and then by a very clever transformation, he figured out how to take the case where the split of the monopole field lines wasn't just lying in the in the equator, but tipped the whole thing, so the thing goes wobbling around, and it creates a current sheet whose structure, as you go outwards looks like this. This is the meridional cross-section. And this thing is a frozen-in wave. It's carried with the wind, occupies a sector from the equator up to uh, a latitude that's equal to the tip angle of the, di of the dipole axis from the rotation axis. In the polar regions, it's just circularly polarized, winding around in one direction here, opposite direction down below. Uh, if I take a slice through this in the equator, you see this uh, sector structure. First, the magnetic field, this thing is dying out. So that's, uh, first, the magnetic field is going this way, then that way, then this way, then that way. And that means between every reversal, there's a current sheet. Um, people have realized that for a long time, just thinking about the equator. This gives you an idea of the global topology. It goes up, winds down, comes up, down. And it's this frozen in, it's a wave. But it's a frozen in wave. It's traveling with the same velocity as the overall wind, which is carrying this whole magnetic structure. Uh, this I uh, had fun turning this into uh, a three-dimensional projection of what one of these current sheets looks like for the 60-degree rotator. You can see it's sort of nested and sort of surrounding the star. And the map in the middle is a, a current, is, a, is, a, is actually a map of curl B from uh, Spitkowski's simulation. And you can see the topology is the same as the aligned rotator. There's the closed field lines right here. And the current sheet takes off from the Y point there. But now instead of lying flat in the rotational equator, it starts off as part of this uh, topological thing here. Okay. Yeah? So uh, uh, I guess that the structure um, will depend on the rotation uh, and how the rotation angle is. I mean, this yes, the yes. So how will it change when you change it when you make it like 30 degrees? Well, what happens is, uh, I didn't put it up here, I guess, but I can go find it if necessary, like later afterwards if necessary. But what happens is, as you tip it up more and more to be in the aligned rotator, this sector here, whose latitude was equal to the obliquity, okay, if I make it the aligned rotator, this whole thing collapses down and becomes a flat current sheet again. So this thing occupies a smaller and smaller sector. The wavelength, which is just this light center distance, stays the same. The separation of the current sheets in the equator here stays the same. That's set by the rotation. Okay, so in the, in in uh, uh, moving at the speed of light in one rotation time, you the distance you move the, uh, the half wavelength is pi times this light cylinder distance. And that's as long as it's sensibly force free and relativistic. That's always the number. If you do it in MHD and allow for it being a velocity less than c, then that wavelength becomes v over c times the light summing distance. So for the uh, orthogonal rotator, do you end up having some sort of discontinuity at the? You know, I actually don't know. It's very funny toward the pole. But this whole toroidal region in the pole disappears, and the whole thing is replaced by these current sheets that really surround the star. The whole current is carried in these current sheets. And I think if you make it. Formally, if you make it the orthogonal rotator, you're left with a line current along the polar axis. And so you've got to balance the current somehow. So it's, but I actually don't know. It's a good question. So remember, our object of the exercise is to understand why we got low sigma. So one idea that's been around since near the beginning of study of pulsars, this is first mentioned by Kurt Michael, 
that the oblique rotator should have this uh, wound up current sheet structure. Anybody who's paid any attention at all to magnetospheres, space plasmas, whatever you say, or solar plasma, you say the word current sheet and you think dissipation. The, the dissipation word that's most commonly mentioned in the astrophysics literature is reconnection. But that's only one example of, the, of uh, reconnection of a particular kind of flow that depends on dissipation which reorganizes the topology of the magnetic field and by so doing makes it more possible for the field to dissipate by various interesting routes. So this little picture on the left uh, is, uh, uh, comes from Ferd Carnidi's paper in 1990 on this topic where he made a rather more specific quantitative model of the dissipation. Uh, that is, there's the um, slice through the current sheet, there's the helical wind and the poles, there's the toroidal wind, uh, toroidal field in the, uh, in the equator with the current sheets there uh, and forming these so-called stripes of magnetic field. And you should realize that in this, this stripe wind region, the whole magnetic field that's in here is supported by these current sheets that are going back and forth through there. Okay, so if I dissipate this current sheet here, I'll be dissipating this component of the magnetic field. If you do it at a rate where there's time to have the dissipation to go to completion, the implication is that this toroidal thing, this field would disappear and this helical wind would expand and fill this all out so the thing lands up far enough away looking like the aligned rotator. Okay, so one class of models for what's feeding the Crab Nebula and other such nebulae is the magnetic field of the aligned rotator by the time you're far away. Not everybody believes that because in, in the underlying question, is there time to do all that? That depends on the dissipation rate, um, which depends on, actually depends on something we can measure. Whether there's time or not depends on something we can measure, which is the mass loading of the system. Um, so now I apologize. I'm a little old-fashioned here. Part of this talk is given an old-fashioned way with slides that have words and formulas on them. The, number, the proportion of movies and pictures to words is unusually low. Uh, I don't think you're going to apologize. It's okay. You know, it's possible to think this way as well as with, with moving pictures. But um, someday when I'm done working on this, I'll probably have more pictures. But they're not, not everything is covered with pictures yet. So there's an important point that it took me a long time to realize that uh, you have a causality limit on this. If you want to play this kind of scenario, you want the field to dissipate. You're zipping along at the speed of light with a Lorentz factor gamma wind. Okay? And you're going to collide with the outside world when the dynamic pressure of this wind is equal to the pressure of whatever is out there on the outside. In some of these nebulae, we can measure that pressure, so we uh, we know where it should be, and every time we can measure the out pressure on the outside and the energy loss on the inside, the, uh, the, what seems to have been the wind lights up and starts shining and hitting a dissipation surface at the end, uh, which is where you would expect a shock to form as a result of a supersonic wind or super any wind colliding with the surroundings. Works every time. Um, so. It doesn't have to be a shock wave that does it, but that's the simplest and most plausible thing. Um, what we'd like, the story we'd like, at least I would like to be true, is that as the sheets are expanding in the, wind, uh, in the wind frame, dissipation causes them to get thicker. So let me go back one. Right here, they're drawn as infinitesimally thin. But the uh, idea that Carnidi pursued in particular, and that I, being an old fusty conservative, think is certainly worth pursuing and is probably right, is that dissipation sets in. There's, you put a resistor in the circuit, it makes the sheets thicker. You keep on dissipating and they expand. The plasma in the sheet is heated uh, and provides pressure support in the magnetic field that's crushing in from each side. And uh, as the dissipation occurs, the magnetic field is going into the sheet. The sheets are expanding, eating the magnetic field until finally the, that magnetic field in these stripes is gone. Uh, so to do that, you can't have those things expand faster than the speed of light. Uh, so you have to have time in the flow frame for all this to happen. So this little toy little calculation is that the sheets are separated by half the overall wavelength, which is 
uh, pi times the light cylinder distance times gamma of the wind. Uh, this, this, is, this is the wavelength as seen in the proper frame of the flow, which I'll call the wave frame. So if I'm sitting in the lab, this wave structure is zipping past me. The field is oscillating back and forth at the rotation period of the pulsar. But being an MHD flow, I can transform to the frame where the, where the, where the oscillating wave field is at rest. There's no longer any electric field. And in that frame, lengths, uh, lengths are all lengthened out. So I get this factor of gamma from my length scale there. Um, the time to have these sheets merge then is that wavelength um, divided uh, by the expansion velocity, which I call B sub S here, of the uh, flow in the sheets. And now I want to know, compare how much time it takes for this merger to occur to what is happening, the time I have available back in the lab frame which is the distance, I, the time I have is the distance to propagate till I slam into the end. So that's another factor of gamma, gamma wind times the wind, proper wavelength divided by the expansion velocity of the sheet. Uh, so I get gamma squared times the light cylinder distance divided by the expansion velocity of the sheet. The flow time to the termination shock in the nebula frame is simply that radius uh, divided by C. In the case of the Crab Nebula, that radius is like 10 to the ninth light cylinder radii. That's just a measured number. Um, and you can have this model work only uh, if the um, uh, time for the sheets to expand and merge is less than the time to flow to the end, which leads to saying gamma wind has to be less than a few 10 to the fourth. Now, I'll bet you nobody in this room has really read the literature on this stuff, but if you, if you ever do, you will find it's replete with what was said in the first successful model of what the nebula looks like in a one-dimensional modeling of MHD structure of the nebula, which said gamma was 10 to the sixth. So you get up and say this to the observers, and they're just shocked. How can you say that? But that's what you need if you're going to do this. And there's uh, other arguments as to why this should be so. Uh, the, um, if you do destroy the magnetic field then, and turn the magnetic energy into flow energy, forget about radiation for the moment, uh, then you land up with the end, all the energy loss is carried simply by the kinetic energy of the plasma. The magnetic energy has now become small right? because we've had magnetic dissipation turn it into, uh, into kinetic energy. Um, and in the model I'll zip through the rest of, it does so by turning first the, energy, the magnetic energy into heat and then the pressure gradients accelerate the wind. Uh, that tells you that the, there's something that's very familiar to gamma ray burst people. It depends on the mass that I have. An energy input E dot, and I divide by the mass loss rate, and that gives me the Lorentz factor of the flow. Uh, the, if you take the mass loss rate number of pairs electron positron pairs reckon that you infer must be there using the radio astronomy of these nebulae, not focusing on the x-rays, uh, then the inference from that is that you have a uh, number loss rate that's at least 10 to the 40th and probably more like 10 to the 41 per second. Remember, the goal like Julian flux was 10 to the 34. And uh, what I used to consider honest pair creation theories would give like somewhere between 10 to the 38 and 10 to the 39. So this actually is a statement of one of the puzzles of this subject. We have a pretty good theory these days of what the energy loss rate is. We do not have a good theory of the mass loss rate. And, uh, uh, that number is, so there is one solution which I proposed a long time ago that the low density flow is in the equator and that gives feeds the x-ray source and at a higher latitude it's much higher density. Uh, and that's where it's coming from in sort of polar outflow. There hasn't been a successful implementation of that yet. But all these gowns are... They're all latitude so average. Large that, you know, that we causally disconnected from over, over latitude or something. Uh, back where the magnetic field is strong, the, to get things to collapse, they have, there has to be time for them to become causally connected. That's part of the issue. At gamma equals 10 to the 6, that hypothesis can't be sustained. You can't expand sideways fast enough to ever have it occur. At gamma of 10 to the 4, it's, it's, it's a, unless, that's okay. You can do it in principle. 
you, become, you, you have a chance to become causally connected if you go the full distance out to the, where the termination is. I mean, those are all variants of this, this argument here. So uh, to make this kind of theory work, you need a uh, high density outflow for reasons we don't fully understand. Uh, you have relatively fast sheet, sheet dissipation that's rephrased in terms of what's the expansion velocity of the sheets. Uh, the expansion over, the thickening over C has to be greater than a percent or so. And if the, the number fluxes down to the minimum of the radio astronomy demands of 10 to the 40, it's a hefty fraction of the speed of light. So that's rapid dissipation. So now I'll go and provide you with some rapid dissipation. The thought I've pursued is that uh, if you look at this current sheet structure, I've got current sheet here, current sheet next to it going oppositely, then the next one going opposite to that. I have a counterstreaming flow, which is they're next to each other. And the moment you breathe the word counterstreaming to a plasma physicist, they're sort of, you know, their hearts warm up, their eyes sparkle. They say, free energy, free energy for plasma instabilities. So here be a plasma instability. It depends on how you want to think of it. It's a uh, two neighboring, two stream instability. It's dynamics, if it's one in the electromagnetic form, is rather like the so-called Weibel instabilities that have been very popular amongst gamma ray burst people. Uh, it's, uh, it can be thought of instead as a shear flow instability. There's, there's a shearing flow of them going by each other. And the underlying point uh, is that the currents that are flowing here here, so here's magnetic field was going this way on one side of the sheet, opposite way, then the original way again. And if I repeated it, I'd see more and more of these things. And if I went far enough, separation here is a half a, pro a proper light cellular distance. If I went further, I'd get, want to get a fancy, I'd have to make them ever, sh if the star is really sitting way over there on the left, they get, they get more intense as you go back to the left and less intense to the right. What I'm about to do here, I don't take account of it at all. This is all local stuff. Uh, in between the sheets, I have a very strong magnetic field with a magnetic field which is in the so-called high sigma MHD regime. Magnetic energy is large compared to the rest energy density. So an alphane wave or a magnetosonic wave traveling between these guys travels at the speed of light, just under the speed of light. They can communicate. So if I tweak the current in one sheet, it can interact with a tweak on the other current. And the usual thing in a two-stream instability, I do that, they're passing through each other. And so the tweak here, the forces due to one charge density or current density tweak exert accelerating and decelerating forces on the opposite stream, which reinforce the tweaks and make the fields go stronger. I don't have to have them pass through each other. They can pass next to each other as long as they can communicate. And they can communicate just fine because the electromagnetic waves that go back and forth between these things travel essentially at the speed of light. It's very important in doing this that the proper wavelength still be small compared to the uh, uh, radius so that uh, the system can be thought as almost homogeneous. So uh, in order to try to do astronomy rather than spend, you know, umpty ump time on ever fancier versions of plasma instability of an inhomogeneous system, I really simplified things. My model of the current sheet I'm using is this very simplified thing right here. There's magnetic field going out of the board there, into the board there, in between is a channel, which is essentially unmagnetized. What this represents is this is a more honest model of a current sheet, it's a so-called Harris model, where the magnetic field has a tanch profile. And uh, the scale length, if you get into the central regions of this, the magnetic field is sufficiently weak that a charged particle coming in here, instead of happily gyrating a field line, instead goes racking along this channel in essence, bouncing off the walls. And there are very, people have done very detailed orbits of what happens to charged particles moving in this gradient, and they go, the ones toward the middle go, duh, 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 duh. and those are the current carriers. The guys out here, they can indeed carry current in the magnetic field out here, but they have to do drift motions across the magnetic field. As you get into the stronger and stronger field, the velocity becomes the thermal velocity of the particle times some fraction of, times alarm radius ratio to some scale length, and they rapidly become non-relativistic. So the strongest currents are in the central region. And I've taken them to be relativistic beams, which is a 
can be a controversial assertion. There are reasons to do so, but I don't want to. I want to have much time to get into that. Uh, you can phrase what keeps my magnetic field reverse in different ways. You can say there's electric current here, and there's a jump in the current. Uh, the, the jump in the magnetic field is proportional to the surface current. And then you can go through that, and if you say, as this picture implies, that the surface current flows in a channel whose thickness is of order the formal larmer radius of the particles, you can convert that over into the MHD expectation that the pressure in the middle here is equal to the magnetic pressure on each side. Those are equivalent statements, electrodynamically and uh, macroscopic MHD. This larmer radius here is uh, twice this thickness H, if you want to do this, R radius is then the temperature, the energy of the particles divided by Q of the particles carrying the current, and the magnetic field outside. Okay. And it's quite small. I mean, it's quite amazing numbers you get here. If you take reasonable numbers for what the temperature is back near the light cylinder, you get thicknesses of this, which if you were to map the field lines where you're doing this back down to the surface, the set thickness of the current layer is uh, uh, nanometers. Um, so the, very, the currents are quite high density. Now, if you want to do an instability, the one I've found that is, seems most interesting, it looks like, kind of like a Weibel instability. Imagine you took the magnetic field that we had originally and ripple it. So it's, I ripple it with a direction, a, in a direction parallel to the background magnetic field. The background, the equilibrium current is flowing in this vertical direction, Z, here and I ripple it with delta B pointing in the X direction. X corresponds to the flow, outflow direction. So if you think about it, this is the same as the polarization of an alphane wave that you would like to make traveling along the magnetic field. But it's not a regular alphane wave because this is very inhomogeneous. I've got this sharp jumps in the, in the current density, sharp jump in the magnetic field. So if you want to find out what's going on formally, which I haven't plagued you with, uh, writing down dispersion relations, like you spend time finding the eigenfunctions for the problem and piecing it together so as to find out uh, what your dispersion relation is. Physically, uh, what you have is a J naught here, and you make a delta B, that if you look at what J naught cross delta B is, uh, it's pointing in the direction uh, uh, along the B naught direction that likes to compress the plasma into uh, density compressions as you're going in the direction parallel to B. So you can imagine long filaments of plasma forming parallel to the original current. And those of you who have read the GRB literature and people yelling about Weibel instability will say, gee, those words sound kind of familiar. And the, that's what it is. This is a Weibel instability in flatland. It uh, compresses the surface, the surface density into filaments parallel to J naught. Those surface current filaments reinforce the delta Bx you started with, and so it runs away. And one can produce a dispersion linearized growth theory of this, where the typical growth rate looks like this animal I wrote down on the left, of which the only thing you should notice is that being, since I modeled the sheets as infinitely thin here, the, it, it, it claims that the growth rate will indefinitely increase with increasing k, a shorter and shorter wavelength. That's an artifact of not taking explicitly the internal structure of the sheet into account which can be done, but it leads to quite a bit more elaborate kinds of stuff. Uh, and uh, the growth rate has this interesting dependence on, uh, in particular, on K parallel itself um, over there. Omega A is just the alphane wave uh, frequency of something that's carried along. <coughs> Sorry using the relativistic alphane velocity, which is important to do. If you don't use the relativistic alphane velocity, you'll get speeds greater than C, which is not um, very helpful. Uh, where I think this goes, well, there are, if I had, in the course of time, there will, I will get, finally get done a PIC simulation, and there will be lots of pretty pictures of current filaments forming and doing all that, uh, is you get sustained Weibel turbulence. The current has to flow, and so you're getting fluctuations to the magnetic field which like to scatter the particles. Remember, I created a delta B, which was orthogonal to the current flow. So once I make delta B big enough, a charge particle coming by in the current is scattered, and now I've inserted a resistor in the circuit. Okay. 
which is what I was looking for. I want to find some dissipation. I need some resistivity. So this is an anomalous resistivity model. And I did it the simplest way. There are fancier things you could do. Once you make the anomalous resistivity, you can get reconnection to occur. I made it simpler than that. I simply said I put a resistor in the circuit. It gets heat, and the sheet simply expands. What's the characteristic uh, resistivity? Well, if you look at the scattering of a charged particle from these fluctuations, the scattering rate looks like the, the cyclotron frequency, relativistic cyclotron frequency in the perturbed fields times some sort of autocorrelation time. And the second thing you find out is by doing a little toy saturation model, how far can you grow before the fluctuating fields stop the relative, relevant beams or try to? That says that this delta omega c gets about equal to the linear growth rate. And there are a number of different ways you can do that. Uh, the, sl the slickest is, the, is a quasi-linear theory. The more hand-wavy is charged particles are once the you have a filament that forms with a certain dimension, and once the Larmé radius of a particle in the perturbed field becomes equal to the weight to the the radius of the filament, then it's deflected. Uh, and that gives the same answer. This autocorrelation time is not known. Uh, it's typically not very long compared to the growth time. So I just put a parameter in here. And this will show up very quickly in an alpha. All dissipation things involving magnetic fields, there's an alpha that appears sooner or later. It appears here, too. And the underlying un unknown physics, I think, is this autocorrelation time there, which needs to be investigated with a more serious nonlinear theory. If you do this and say, ask yourself what the magnetic diffusivity is, it's, there's an effective conductivity, which is uh, omega p squared of the particle beams carrying the current divided by this effective collision frequency. Assemble that into a magnetic diffusivity. And lo and behold, you land up with what amounts to the Bohm diffusion rate. Uh, H here, the thickness, is the Larmor radius. So this is really C times the Larmor radius. And that's what Mr. Bohm said. Oh, that's what's causing our fusion machines to leak out all of a sudden. The par charged particles scatter every time they do a gyro orbit and don't wait around for a uh, true Coulomb collision. Here, by quite different, quite, quite different means, you get uh, uh, something that looks the same. And depending what you think on what the wavelength of these things is when they saturate, this is either that's all there is, or there might be further dependence on the um, actual thickness. I've done my astronomical modeling, assuming that the uh, wavelength of the instability is about equal to the thickness of the channel in which stuff can flow, which is, I think, the most likely thing. But there's some possibility, and the formal growth theory indicates there is growth of comparable magnitude, even if the wavelength is as long as the separation between the sheets. Um, and that will take some more refined analysis. Uh, alpha here is this combination like that, and you just take it as being a number, a number of order unity, which everybody always says. Um, OK. Uh, once I have this magnetic diffusivity around, I'm going to get sheet to heat. And if you step back and ask yourself, what is, how does the proper entropy behave? Remember, H is proportional to the temperature. So being proportional to temperature, I can go back to my uh, first, law, first law of thermodynamics and look at what's going on here. The first term is the uh, uh, DSDT. The, the second is the adiabatic expansion of the sheet, and the finally on the right is the uh, J dot E work that's actually causing the entropy to change. Now, when you do this, when Carnidi first worked out his thing, he did this, he, he, you know, it was a really amazing paper. Uh, he got what he was looking for at gamma equals 10 to the sixth, didn't pay any attention to this time scale thing. Uh, he did it all with gamma, the wind to wind outflow held constant. Now, you're throwing magnetic energy away, and you start out with magnetic energy is almost all there was. Where did the energy go? Uh, he, just, he, didn't read, he didn't let it radiate. He didn't let it accelerate. Uh, about a decade ago, uh, John Kirk and Yuri Libarsky said, now, wait a minute here. There's ought to be acceleration. So they put the heat back in to accelerate the flow, and they have a variant of this, which uh, 
does things, some things I think is kind of strange, but uh, has results that are somewhat similar. Uh, so you need to have both entropy, entropy generation and energy conservation. Well, what I've done here is simply take the energy going into the pressure and the pressure accelerating it. And that leads to this for the acceleration of the wind. Uh, it has this rather typical 1 over gamma squared. So it's the longitudinal mass, m gamma cubed, that's being increased. Um, and the rate here very nicely turns into g is just the energy loss rate divided by m dot c squared. So over there on the right-hand side, this is the maximum that the gamma can ever get to. And uh, if you uh, look at this, you can get a similarity solution with gamma wind going like r to the one-third and the thickness of the sheet in ratio to the proper wavelength going like r to the one-third. So you can ask yourself, the first way you start is, can I get rid of the magnetic field? I'd better give, be sure that the sheets thicken up until they're equal to the wavelength, half wavelength to be more precise, before I hit the termination shock. Does that work? Well, as advertised, it does if the wind has got enough mass loading to it. That is, it's going slow enough. If it's going too fast, there's not enough time. So the merger distance looks like this. It's E dot over M dot C squared squared. And there's my funny little parameter there, which I'm going to talk as if I know that alpha beam is of order unity. It probably is, but I don't know for sure. And that's the multiplier of the light cylinder distance, which is a few, few 10 to the eighth. If I say the mass loss rate is 10 to the 40th E plus minus per second, which is a good number for the crab. In others, we're just starting now. The Bukit and I are doing a little project of and Ellen Amato were all working on a little project of applying similar analysis to the plasma content of several others of the PWN to see whether you could make similar conclusions. The answer is kind of yes, but you very rapidly discover that people just haven't done the observations more often than not to really nail it down. Uh, so one part of our reason to write the blasted paper is to insult the observers enough that they'll go out and, do, and find out a little more. Um, the, um, and that could be less than our shock if you have mass loss rates above 10 to the 40th particles per second. Um, as I say, the main wiggle parameter is this alpha beam here. If the autocorrelation time were very long, I would get a very different alpha beam would be bigger and that, uh, it would be better if I, the autocorrelation time was very short, uh, then I'd be in, be in trouble. OK, uh, we think at the moment that this 10 to the 40th per second or more is really is needed for feeding the crab. So that's good. Now, this is all fine. This is typical astrophysics theory. We know something. We're, I'm giving you a just so story as to why it is. However, it is, I've always thought in working on this stuff and reading other people's stuff on it that saying I converted all of my energy into kinetic energy and kept everything just as dark as it was in the first place, little bananas. I mean, you must get radiation. The, uh, so here's a quick story about radiation, and then I'll quit. Uh, I've gone on too long already. Um, if I go back into my current sheet and ask, I have an idea of what its thickness is, uh, I, uh, I'm calculating its, th calculating its thickness. I'm also calculating the temperature. So what is that temperature? Well, temperature in units of here, rest energy is very large. You know, T over mc squared is 10 to the 8 normalized to all this stuff. Uh, and then put the numbers in this is 50 TeV. Okay. Hey, we observe TeV these days and with ever increasing sensitivity. So maybe there's something here to see. Fine, the charged particles are whipping along this channel, they're bouncing off the walls, they're doing a piece of synchrotron radiation. You can be more precise of having particles doing this wandering orbit, but it's not, it's not worth it at the present time. Uh, so if you calculate the synchrotron luminosity of this thing over E dot, it's a few 10 to the minus 3, maybe a bit more. This is then normalized to numbers appropriate for the uh, crab. And you'll notice here an important point. The return current could be protons drawn up from the star. If that were the case, that's M-beam down there. If that were the case, it's radiatively very inefficient. So here the return current is being thought of as it's, it's being carried by either positrons or electrons, whose provenance I tried to outline where I think they would be coming from. Uh, 
you go through a little toy calculation of the synchrotron spectrum, what happens is that uh, if, it's, if you treat it really as thermal synchrotron, then there's a characteristic frequency you're radiating at, and that's kind of where the energy is all coming out. Characteristic of each radius. So you add up all of these shells of stuff and do it without any time resolution, and you see the spectrum, which turns out to be dead flat in ergs. This is ergs per hertz. Uh, in terms of, since we're going to land up talking about high energy photon detection, you want a number per hertz, and that's energy to the minus one. It's a very flat spectrum. Uh, the, um, it's probably optically thin, and maybe the very highest energy, there might be some photon photon absorption. But that depends on what the target photons is, we don't have a good handle on. Uh, and the spectrum extends all the way down to merger radius, which is optical UV, and that certainly would be unpulsed. Um, now, the steady luminosity calculated here is not consistent with the observed TEV spectrum of the Crab Nebula, which is more like energy to the minus, in terms of photons per hertz is energy to the minus two and a half, one and a half power is steeper. But this is too faint. You can't see that against the steady bright source. Uh, so, is it pulsed? Probably is, you know, could, it could be pulsed. That's I think is a lot more precise. Where do you get pulsed from? Well, you fix your mind on a given photon energy. According to this very simple spectrum, the, the given photon energy is radiated in one radius when a sheet crosses that radius, that's where its characteristic emission frequency would be, and that's where it will emit that spectrum. Okay? And then one rotation period later, another sheet comes by, and another sheet comes by. So if the radiation is, really is in the form of these sheets, it will come in being pulsed. Now, that's a little oversimplified. Uh, number one, the spectrum is not all, it's not monochromatic. It has a width, and thermal synchrotron has a width that's comparable to the frequency you're radiating at. So it's spread out some. Uh, the, uh, to the observer, then, the sheet will radiate a time, uh, the, the time, the, the thickness of the radiating, the radiation thickness of that thing. Uh, but you, 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 what you see it is in retarded time. So it's gamma squared shorter than the proper time at which it emits. Um, and, uh, if, if that radiative time is less than the rotation period, the um, sheet stays in phase with its emitter bef during the whole time the emitter is on, and it does appear to you as a pulse. If instead the sheet stays in phase with its emitter too long, it's too spread, and it overlaps the next one. So the condition for that is that this radiation time be small compared to the rotation period, and that means gamma can't be uh, too low, uh, R can't be too big, uh, which means that the pulse radiation, if it's there, comes from the uh, inner, inner wind. Uh, by the time you get out to distances of order, the optical emission region in this kind of model, it's, uh, the, you violate this condition and it won't, it won't it be pulsed. Cool. Yeah. Uh, it takes too long to radiate. So um, now this is very sloppy. You know, is, is it even, even when, it's, when they're overlapping some, is it still modulated? People can do quite high sensitivity observations of this kind of thing. They know what period they're looking for. So that's going to take uh, quite a bit more work. But loosely speaking, the inner wind like, could, well, could well radiate pulse TeV and GeV. Um, and it's unlikely to ra radiate pulse optical. Uh, yeah, Fermi's having a hard time with these guys because it's faint and their detection area is not very large. It's actually easier in the TV because they're big telescopes. And, and then you know a period that you're folding against and you don't think the system is changing. You just keep looking. But the answer to that is yes. Uh, it's really more prediction for CTA, the, uh, the next generation TV experiment. There are upper limits from Hess on both the Crab and others in pulse TV emission. Well, you know, there's basically they're doing that for the Crab and Vila. They're kind of monitoring reference sources, and uh, that can be eventually be stacked. 
And I have a different project that I'm kind of embedded them about that requires monitoring, and this is another one. Um, the, um, so uh, there are high upper limits on pulsars. They went looking. Uh, unfortunately, their sensitivity isn't quite high enough for this. The flux predicted, at least from the model, it's not, I was hoping I could kill this with the existing data because, you know, this is interest, it's interesting kinds of ideas, but it's, you make progress by actually getting, get, by exclusion more, as much as you do by uh, proposing. I can't kill it yet, but we're working on it. Okay, so I've gone way over time. Current sheets and high sigma winds, according to me, decay due to anomalous resistance. The sheets and the striped pulsar winds don't survive the termination shock. Uh, it requires a large mass loading, which is in terms of the underlying theory of compact object outflows. That's the most important conclusion. You, can, you really need to make a relatively high density system, at least as measured by the fiducial charge densities that go along with these relativistically strong rotating magnetic fields. The inner wind seems to want to create synchrotron emission from the sheets. And the bolar resonant luminosity is a small fraction of the total energy loss, maybe detectable at higher energies. Uh, it's because it runs up to an energy higher than the Hess people really found much. And if we look for more sensitivity up there, maybe there's something peeking out in that flat spectrum. Uh, it could be pulsed at the highest energies. Uh, it might be detectable now or as we're just discussing in the immediate future. And something I left out because I knew I was going to run over time uh, is uh, there are related stories that one can say about jets. There's one class of jet models which wind up the field in the same way. And more generally, uh, this whole business of toroidal fields very likely, uh, which are thought to be present in jets, very likely uh, well, they could have uh, instability, which causes them to form internal current sheets, which will do some sort of dissipation for which this may possibly be relevant. Okay, thank you. Now I can get out from behind the podium. Uh, the modes in question of actually in the sheet, the stuff that's, that's, that's coupling the sheets together is a hydromagnetic perturbation. The structure of what's actually in the sheet is it's instead, uh, here in this the theory, it appears as surface density fluctuations. That's very similar to the electromagnetic disturbances that are in a typical Weibel instability, which are uh, semi-static non-propagating magnetic fields. They change in time, but they don't go anywhere because the electric field is small compared to the, to the magnetic field. That's true even with a relativistic Weibull instability. So these behave like that. It's a coupling between that hydromagnetic wave cup between the sheets and the surface modes of, of the sheet itself. We'll have coffee and cookies. Good. Uh,